authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me today is going to be Norman D. Ellis, and we're going to be talking about a rather fascinating book she's got out on the market called Imagining the World into Existence, and i got to tell you, it's a pretty fascinating book. Uh, I've had a whole entire new view on certain things uh, from my reading of the book, so I think you're really going to enjoy hearing what she has to say, but before we get started into that... I'd like to let everybody know that you can learn more about her and her other books and other material because she also makes uh, rather frequent trips to Egypt. And I'm not sure, but I want to say she does tours, and she can clarify that in a minute when I bring her on uh, that y'all might be interested in. But her website is www.normadyellis.com. And also, if you guys are listening at, uh, I don't know, YouTube or iTunes or somewhere else, I'd love to have you over here live in the chat room talking to us and asking questions in chat at www.talknowradio.com. Uh, feel free to bring a friend with you when you come. Uh, you need a, a membership to get into the chat room. It's there to keep the spam bots out, but the membership is free. So what are you waiting for? Let's get her on. So, Normandy, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing pretty well. It- it's uh, been a nice sunny day heading into the fall, kind of a day I really like. Man, it was like hot and it felt like an oven outside here. Well, yeah, that too, but, you know, it's in the air. The trees are turning yellow and, yeah, it's good. It's all going to be good. Yeah, we've only got to like the middle of September and it's going to start breaking. The heat wave's going to, you know, start dying off, in other words, a little bit at a time. But uh, back to the topic at hand, I usually like to start the show out with um, you giving a, you know, telling everybody a little something about yourself and what got you interested in writing the book. Oh, okay. Well, um, Imagining the World into Existence is, uh, I think it's my fifth book on uh, ancient Egypt. So it's it's been one that I have been kind of fascinated with um all along, because the idea of working in uh, in a magical way uh, with one's own life has always fascinated me. And, you know, we always go back to the ancient Egyptians and think about uh, the things that they were able to accomplish and the fact that they did them so long ago, so many thousands of years ago, and that their culture really was based on uh, being able to be co-creators with the gods, and um, that's how they lived. That's how their culture sustained itself. And it's something that, you know, if we think of ourselves as co-creators with God, then we have the capacity to create a reality that's uh, far better than the one that we would have if we just sat back and let things happen. So I think that that's one of the things that's always fascinated me about, you know, the great builders and the great thinkers of ancient Egypt. Yeah, I think one of the uh, best known of all the gods of ancient Egypt would have been Toth, who has also been equated with uh, Hermes Trismegistus, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah, Trismegistus, Hermes Trismegistus. Yeah, Thoth is... um, he is one of the uh, creator gods. There are several different ones. In the same way that, you know, the Christian Bible has different versions of Genesis, if you actually look at it, it has different stories about how the world came into being. Well, so did the Egyptians. And uh, Thoth had a, a way of creating the world by, um, basically, it was almost like a scientific or a, a method of DNA. You know, he had this cauldron that had eight beings spinning around in it that were related to time and space and density and light and dark and and um, the story that depicts how these beings link up with each other actually resembles uh, a DNA chain you know there's this uh, mathematical equation uh, as 
life is being born, and it says, first I was two, one, then I was two, then I was four, then I was eight, and then I was one again. And so you can see the spiraling almost of the DNA connecting, you know, connecting its links uh, up the chain and the ladder. And uh, Soth has this caduceus that has two snakes that climb up it and uh, link with this kind of DNA sort of structure yeah, as well. So his way of creating is mathematical and scientific, and there's a god whose name is Pata, who speaks the world into being, you know, in the beginning was the word. So there are lots of different ways of creating, just as there are lots of different ways that we individuals on the planet create. You know, we create with music, we create with, uh, we sculpt things. There's a god who's a sculpture, sculptor, uh, who makes people out of clay, just like the story in the Bible. Uh, his name is Kanum. Um, so, you know, all those old Egyptian stories show us all the ways that are possible for us to join the divine in creating the reality that we want. Um. Okay, um, I know that I read uh, a lot of that, which you was just sharing, was in the, the very early portion of your book. I remember reading that, and you go into mm-hmm. much uh, even more fascinating parts as well. But while you are here, I couldn't help but think that a lot of these were, uh, and I think you mentioned it in your book as well, if I understood it correctly, were kind of like mythical retellings that were really about the principle of how everything happened. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Good way of putting that. Now, so was this really a um, a kind of an allegorical description of uh, the interplay between different energies? Well, I think that's, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It depends on how you define allegory, like, because some people will say, well, allegory is not real. It's just a story. Um, and I think that there are a lot of things, when we're using our intuition and we're telling stories, oftentimes we're telling things in a much more real way than we could possibly tell it through the use of symbol. I mean, parables have always been, you know, a way of instructing spiritual truth, and so, so is mythology. Um, so I would say that there's, the possibility, I'm going to say, the possibility that it was already known scientifically how certain things were created. And when we think about the spirit world, the thing that really confuses people, I think, is that they imagine that, um, they imagine that, that the spirit world is just as sequential as the physical world we live in, you know, like, they imagine that you have uh, karma that goes, you know, from, like, ancient Egypt to the present day. But they don't allow for the idea that there's karma that's being created in the future that maybe is being lived out now. Time and space are nothing in the spirit world. You know, that's always that's only a construct that we have to work with in this level. So having said that, you know... You can dream and imagine a life forward um, in the same way that you can see right now, you know, we may be dreaming in ancient Egypt. Do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't right. have to be something that happened in the past. Um, I think that's how people like Leonardo da Vinci and, and um, you know, Albert Einstein and, and other people that we think of as geniuses, they leapt into the future you know, had a lifetime there and experience and then came back into, you know, a temporal zone and then created something that was for the future to discover later. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does. But, um, I mean, this would go, go start dipping in. It's sort of like quantum mechanics, too, though, and time travel. But you're right. talking about mental time travel, not... A, or spiritual, which to me, mental and spiritual are pretty much close to the same thing, and I could be wrong about that. But the point I'm getting at is, um, you know, I think this is also how the prophets 
would look into the future and see the end of time, in other words. Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, and I think, I think that it's something that if we stopped thinking of ourselves as, you know, temporal beings, you know, stuck in time and space, that there was a, there would be a whole reality that we could access. You know, I'm teaching a class right now on, uh, called Astral Egypt, which is all about, uh, what happens to us in our dream times. And a lot of people, in the current day, who really don't know anything about Egypt, do have dreams that have Egyptian themes. And I have talked with some of them, and it's rather interesting, the things that they come up with, because it's just it's so in our consciousness. And they will dream, for example, how uh, a pyramid is constructed, or they'll dream where certain materials will be found you know, where they were in the past, and then, lo and behold, somebody finds them in the present, you know. Um, Edgar Casey did that. Did, yes, Edgar Casey did that. There was a woman named Dorothy Eady who um, believed she was an ancient Egyptian. Uh, I have read her Egyptian. name in yeah. more than one book uh, dealing with reincarnation. That's right, that's right. And she would tell archaeologists, dig there. And they would dig there and find things that she would tell them were there, that they had no clue. You know, and of course she couldn't have known except that, you know, she had lived in the last life. And yet people doubt her, um, doubt her past lives, even though she was able to uncover buried evidence. That's right. And we don't think anything about leaving our, you know, current time and place behind when we dream, we just like get up out of our bodies and and our soul goes traveling, you know, and then we'll come back to this time and place, but it can go wherever it wants. And it's entering into, you know, an astral or a lower spirit realm when it does that. Well, are we traveling back in our time or in a uh, different time in a different dimension? Uh, Well, probably both. <laughs> well, because this talk always comes up with uh, time travel discussion, and it's kind of hard to fathom, um, you know, traveling back to a time that don't exist anymore. Because once I've lived into this minute, the minute before is no longer there, or is it? Or is there a shadow of it there you can go back through? Well, yeah, but when you enter into meditation, you can go there because you're not. You're not trying to take your your physical body with you. You're leaving it in the chair, and you can meditate and go there. And who's to say that's not, it's not your imagination. It's just as real if you can tap into what is there and then bring what is there back to the current time. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, especially if you include the fact that in the very beginning, even the ancient Egyptians always taught, and you're the expert on this, but uh, you you know what I know that uh, well, God was mental in time. Uh, in the beginning of time, there was nothing but God, the great pot, and uh, everything else was mm-hmm. mental. And it, his his thoughts and his words formed all the energy and the vibrations together to make what we got now. That's so right. the same principle works through dreams, though, that you have visions and thoughts. They can be spoken into crystallization if you know how to do it, which is something you write about in your book. Uh, I mean, don't come out and describe how to do it that, that I didn't see, but you talk about how ISIS did it, in other words. Right, I did. And I think that, um, you know, that, that kind of co-creation with reality that we're calling uh, magic, it's basically understanding the words of power, uh, and the language of God, you know, that's the way the Egyptians described it. That that understanding was actually very closely guarded. I mean, not everybody was able to do it. The scrolls were kept in the temples. They were not to be taken out, you know, given to other people. Now, some high priests made copies of some of the scrolls. They didn't want the profane to see it. Right, that's right. But... um in general, it was uh, pretty much a closed, you know, they didn't teach it. They didn't write it down and say, this is how you do it. It, it was told to the this, this priest scribe in training. 
was told mouth to ear how it was done. You know, that's how the information was passed. It wasn't always written down in the text. Right. Well, and of what course, is- a lot of it that was is gone now after Alexandria's been destroyed. You know, the library there. Wasn't that destroyed material. by the church? It was destroyed three times. I think the Romans destroyed it once. I think, uh, I think that, um, the Turks. Well, Ptolemy, who was a Greek, you know, Egyptian ruler, is the one who pulled it all together. And then the Romans, you know, got after it and tried to destroy his work. And then it was being rebuilt, and then the Christians destroyed it. And then the, um, Muslim came in in the six, I guess the six hundreds and like kind of dealt it the final blow. You know, so they burned the scrolls in the Turkish bath. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think what it was, nobody wanted but one kind of, you know, religious material out in the world for ready access. Right, right. And so Alexandria was like a great, you know, cosmopolitan uh, dynamo, but it didn't last very long because people were basically xenophobic. They were afraid of each other, you know. Uh, the Christians were afraid of the pagans and and uh, the science that they knew, and the Egyptians were just trying to, you know, keep it on the the down low and, and as I said, not write things out, not tell people. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it all disappeared. Right. Well, I was going to ask you a minute ago, though, you were talking about uh, the power of words and the, you know, right usage of it and the right words to use. Don't you think a little of that has been preserved in Christianity, um, what with prayer and also with um, asking anything in Jesus' name? Uh, it started with the ancient Egyptians about knowing the God's name. Wouldn't be asking for things in Jesus' name be uh, similar to the old Egyptian principle, for example? Well, it would be similar, right, because you could petition, I mean, if you were an ancient Egyptian, you could petition Isis, you could petition Horus, you could petition whichever divine being you felt closest to. Um, And so, you know, the question then automatically becomes, which divine being is the one that has the most power? I mean, it was one of those questions that even ancient Egyptians asked, so we're still saying the same thing, you know, is it Allah, is it God, is it Yahweh, is it Jesus, is it Buddha, you know. Um, and the ancient Egyptians actually had an answer for that. You know, the priests would say that it goes back to the idea of co-creation, that you um, are a, not only a part of God, but all of us together make up God, that we are all divine in our way and that God exists in each of us because we are having the God experience, you know, through our bodies, you know, as being able to be created. Or God is experiencing life through us. Right, right. And and the text is, you know, this is one of the things that you say when you're walking through the underworld and you're confronted with demons, you know, and things that you have to battle. And let's just say maybe you're walking in your daily life and, You confront things that you have to, you know, overcome. And the way that you do that is you remember this one phrase, which is, God is my name. I do not forget this name of mine. And when you say that, you're you're invoking God. You're not petitioning somebody else outside of you. You're bringing that divine being down into the vessel that you are as your protection and your God, you know, because that's who you are. Of course, we know that the church would say, and I'm not, I left the church long ago in favor of spirituality, but I'm sure you got, you run into this from time to time, that uh, that's what the devil's sin was, is wanting to be like God. What do you say to people that uh, bring that up to you? Well, I, I'm personally have a hard time praying to a God, like I was raised in the uh, Episcopal Church, which is a little bit like the Catholic Church, and one of the things that we used to have to say in church was uh, a phrase that said, um, we are not so worthy as to gather up the crumbs under that table, and I thought, boy, you know, 
that we think so little of ourselves, that must mean that we think so little of God that he would make this thing that's so flawed, so horrible, so despicable even to him. You know, I thought, no, that can't be right. You know, even as a child, I thought, that can't be right. If God is as great as we're saying, he's going to make some great things, and that includes me. Well, one of my greatest questions always was, where was God from the days of Adam to the days of Noah and the great flood? There were some, what, 2,000-odd years in there, I'm guesstimating, or more, that um, I guess all form of sin and everything else was okay, and he didn't care about mankind, and then all of a sudden, uh, after the flood, or actually, well, after that, in the days of Moses, because Moses wrote a, a back history, because uh, he wouldn't have... Anybody's uh, God until then, if you think about it. Why, why did he allow all this paganism to go on, flourish, and blossom so many thousands of years, and then all of a sudden step up and say, "You know what? I decided it's wrong." Oh, well, that, that strikes you kind of <laughs> odd. <laughs> well, what strikes me odd is is when someone uh, believes that something that's written as a story is a, is the truth. Right. That, that, that you know, because a lot. <laughs> that's, it's a story that has been told. Um, the Bible is a collection of wisdom texts from a number of different traditions, you know, and it's been uh, edited and books have been taken out of it by whoever was in any particular kind of uh, position of power in order to do that. The text that we have, there's so many books that have been removed from it, you know, um, that there are stories that have not been told that we're now coming to find in other traditions or found in other scrolls that predate some of these or that are similar to the, the Jewish story or the Jesus story. So, you know, when you're saying what's true, um, I'm going back to what the ancient Egyptians would say, which is that it's all... It's all a bit of truth. Even the hieroglyph for the word truth is written in multiples. I mean, it has a, 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 a glyph that means multiple. It's not just one truth. You know, it all, everything points to the truth. Right. Um, and for me, you know, the whole idea of, of sin, um, I'm not sure that I understand it in the same way that perhaps other people do. My understanding is that sin relates to a word that means missing the mark. Right. That is, you try you try to uh, uphold cosmic order. You know, you try to uphold truth as you know it to the best of your ability. And sometimes, let's face it, there's not a one of us who ever gets it totally right. Um, but then you have to go back and say, okay, I accept responsibility for not getting it right, and so now I'm going to make amends. Okay? That's different. You know, you can walk around thinking sin if you want to and live in what's kind of a, a, a hellish experience while you're here on earth, or you can try to live according to uh, the best of your ability uh, the truth as you know it at that time. Uh, and to, you know, the main thing is to live with love in your heart. You know, if you're doing that, um, you're not going to be too far off. Right. As long as you're living with love in your heart towards yourself and your fellow man and you're being true to yourself, pretty much God can take care of the rest. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I do agree with you. Don't get me wrong. I just, um, well, I, I sometimes like to bring up questions that I know I've been asked because I know you'll be asked and, you know, the listeners would probably like to hear your response, in other words. Right. My brother's always asking me those exact same questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think any good host would ask that kind of a question under the circumstances. Well, at least that's just well, my sure. opinion. Uh, but, um. I do tend to agree with you, and let's face it, to be honest with you, the ancient Egyptians, uh, even according to the Bible, uh, founded Egypt back in the days of Ham, and uh, who was his son, Mizraim or whatever, 
uh, way back thousands of years before Moses, that's still an awful long time to to have a, a pagan religion going in and all of a sudden say, well, that's wrong. It's supposed to be monotheistic. I mean, why let it go so long? Uh, I think the original records are probably the ones that's closest to the truth. And the um, the later records is probably an upsurper. It would make more uh, sense to me, in other words. I mean, what happened with Akhenaten, for example? Yeah, what happened with that guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he, um, you know, he studied with, um, he studied with priests who were uh, connected to the hidden God, the divine God, the God that, you know, sort of, um, was uh, in a hierarchical sense, was above all of the other gods. You know, it's kind of like, it, I tell people to imagine that creativity and and divinity is like a big cup, you know, and the divinity is the water that flows into this one cup, and we look at that container and we say, oh, that's God. But, you know, spirit and divinity keep flowing into it, so there are cups below it that are also divine beings that capture that uh, flow, that divine flow. And so then they have a different name. And then those overflow. And then, you know, it just keeps like these these waters just keep flowing down until they get to us. Um, and it's still all one God spirit. But there's, <laughs> there's a cup up above us that, you know, it kind of started the whole thing, you know, right. the whole fountain. Um, so, and I think that that was, uh, the way the ancient Egyptians understood it. They called it a tomb. Um, you know, in, in the New Kingdom, they called him Amun, and he was light, the god of light. Um, but a tomb was the god of hidden things, and he was both light and dark. He was a little more complex. Well, Akhenaten, uh, didn't like the gods of, of Amun didn't like the priests of Amun because they were kind of money grabbers and and um, he didn't, really didn't think that it was equitable the way they were running the temple. So he took his temple somewhere else and he still believed in, you know, the God of light and the God of the light vibration. Um, and the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful psalms that we have, Psalm, I think it's 104 or 109, I can't remember what, what the number is, but it's Basically, if you compare it, it's the great hymn to Aten, you know, written by Akhenaten. And it's, you know, talking about how you you cast your light over all the land and you touch this and you touch that. It's basically a poem that Akhenaten wrote Then the Hebrews carried into their tradition, into the Hebrew tradition. Right, which uh, if I remember correctly, I read that right after the part about Toth and the gods in between that and the magic of Isis and her words in your book, which is partly why I went there. <laughs> oh, well, I can see you've done your homework. <laughs> I, well, I do try. I really do. But uh, at the t- same time, I'm also like 15 books behind right now for somebody that tries to keep up. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got a big job. <clears throat> but um, also, in addition to that, I've been... Uh, well, I've been really heavy into uh, ancient mysteries for the last 20 years and ancient mythology and, you know, uh, ancient religions and all of that stuff. Uh, I've been having a yearning to find out the truth about the church for years because, well, I knew growing up I didn't have it. And my dad was a preacher and I was a Sunday school teacher and I knew we didn't have it right. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you what, I have been uh, reading some of the Facebook posts of uh, my colleague Robert Raval who's doing a book on the Vatican, and his uh, expertise is in ancient Egyptian literature, and he's talking about the texts that were hidden by the Vatican, you know, the things. It just strikes us odd that the biggest obelisk, you know, which is basically a stone phallus pointing up to the sky, would be right there in the center of Vatican circle, you know? I mean, that just there's something strange about that. <laughs> If you don't think they're connected, I do now, you know. Yeah, I would love to talk to Robert Bavile because I'd also wanted to talk to him about the... uh